In this module, we're going to talk about the close cousin of the acetoester synthesis. It's called the malonic ester synthesis. The malonic ester synthesis relies on something we haven't told you before. It turns out that in the acetoester synthesis, we relied on the fact that a beta keto acid will decarboxylate to generate CO2 and a methyl ketone derivative. Well, it turns out that a diacid will do the same thing. That diacid is called malonic acid. Malonic acid can adopt a conformation that also has a six-membered ring and because of that, it has that very low energy transition state that in the future we're going to call aromatic. And what will happen is it will decarboxylate. That generates the enol of a carboxylic acid and eventually leading to CO2 and a carboxylic acid. So a malonic acid derivative, when heated, will generate a carboxylic acid and CO2. So let's talk about how we can use that in the context of the malonic acid, excuse me, the malonic ester synthesis. So here we go. We're going to start with diethyl malonate. Again, if you look at it, that diacid is called malonic acid. And so diethyl malonate is the diethyl ester. We're going to react that with one equivalent of sodium ethoxide. There's a couple of things you need to notice about this that are important. First of all, the ethyl here has to match the ester in diethylmalonate. The second is just like acetoester, the diethylmalonate is extremely acidic. The pKa is in the 13 range, so that sodium ethoxide is strong enough to quantitatively convert it to the enolate. Okay. When that happens, we have now made a strong nucleophile that can react via what kind of reaction? SN2 reaction. And what kind of product is that going to give us? That would give us a new carbon-carbon bond created between the enolate and the, well, the carbon with the bromine. Exactly. So as you're saying, we have a new carbon-carbon bond exactly where the enolate was created when we deprotonated the diethylmalonate. What we just learned is if we hydrolyze off these esters, we're going to have a malonic acid, which is a beta diacid. <laughs> Thank you. It's a beta diacid. That beta diacid, as we know, this beta diacid, malonic acid, will decarboxylate when we heat it. So when we add H3O in heat, we're going to first hydrolyze off these esters. And then with the heat, we're going to decarboxylate. So at first we hydrolyze those off and we have a beta diacid, a malonic acid derivative. And then because it's going to react spontaneously while we're heating. What are we going to generate? The decarboxylated product. And in that decarboxylated product, notice we have a brand new carbon-carbon bond. That's the one that was originally created between the anion, and the electrophile via the SN2 reaction. But now our product is an acid. And that new carbon-carbon bond is between the alpha and beta carbons of that carboxylic acid. So the acetoester synthesis is a, excuse me, the malonic ester synthesis, sorry, the malonic ester synthesis is a really good way to make complicated carboxylic acids that contain a new carbon-carbon bond between the alpha and beta carbon atoms. 
So now when you look at complicated carboxylic acids, you need to be thinking, can I make that using the malonic ester synthesis process? So just to summarize quickly, the acetoester synthesis allows us to make methyl ketones that have new carbon-carbon bonds at the alpha and beta carbon of that ketone. The malonic ester synthesis allows us to make carboxylic acids with a new carbon-carbon bond between the alpha and beta carbon atoms. Okay, we're not done because I want to talk about something that is important when we realize at the end, we have a second hydrogen here that maybe we could react with. So it turns out that will also be acidic. It is also an alpha carbon to both of these carbonyls. And so it also can be used to create an enolate. That also can be used as a nucleophile. This applies to both acetoester, it applies to malonic ester. However, this is an important point. We can only use methyl bromide or methyl iodide as the haloalkanes. Any other haloalkane that's larger is not gonna react when we already have one group such as this on either a malonic ester or acetoester that only then it has to be small, it has to be methyl bromide, methyl iodide, can we replace this hydrogen as a second step. So why is it that these only these small ones are going to be applied in a second alkylation reaction with either acetoester or malonic ester? Is it because of the steric strings? A hundred percent. Any group that's larger than the methyl or uh, just the methyl bromide or methyl iodide is going to be too large and there's going to be too much steric strain and it won't react. So let's see an example of what I'm talking about. Once again, we're going to start with malonic ester, diethylmalonate. We're going to add one equivalent to make the enolate. We're going to add one equivalent of sodium ethoxide to make the enolate. We're then going to add, in this case, we're going to add propyl bromide. So a primary haloalkane to carry out an SN2, that gives us this alkylated product. Now, I didn't put a star there. I hadn't said this up above. Is that a chiral intermediate? That's not a chiral intermediate because the two esters are symmetric to each other. Exactly. I didn't say this before. I want to do a quick timeout and go back. Notice that in the acetoester synthesis, we create a chiral center, but in the case of the malonic ester, excuse me, the diethylmalonate reaction, we do not in the malonic ester synthesis because these two are the same. So there's no chiral center at this location. So it's a little nuanced, but I just wanted to point that out. Okay. But what we're telling you now is that we can use yet another equivalent of sodium ethoxide. And as long as we use either methyl bromide or methyl iodide only, anything larger, the enolate we get is too sterically hindered to react. But if it's methyl bromide or iodide, we can actually alkylate again and generate this new species that has two new carbon-carbon bonds, the one we originally made with the propyl group and now the one we just made with the methyl group. Again, is this chiral? This is still not chiral because the two symmetric esters are still there. Right, so even though we made two new carbon-carbon bonds, we did not create a chiral center. However, when we hydrolyze those two esters to create the beta diacid, in other words, the malonic acid derivative, that will then decarboxylate. And when it decarboxylates, we're gonna break this carbon-carbon bond to generate this carboxylic acid product. Notice now it's no longer symmetric. And as a result, we have created a chiral center. So the product of that process is racemic. So the KRE here is that we've got a complicated carboxylic acid 
that has not only one new carbon-carbon bond, it also has a carbon-carbon bond created from either methyl bromide or methyl iodide to create this more complicated version of the carboxylic acid derivative as product.